So let me start this off with a quick request. I really want questions and I want disagreements and I want you to say, well, hold on, that makes no sense, what about this? Because if you don't say that, I presume you're asleep and I'm gonna call on you and ask you questions. Um, I used to teach high school English. I'm good at picking on people in back in the corners. You cannot hold me to the grammar even though I taught English. Yes, Aaron? What's that? What if you actually are asleep? Don't snore. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna talk about here is a tale of two teams building a fabulous application for having the ultimate gift list. And it doesn't really matter what the app is for, but if photo sharing's worth a billion, gift, lifts are worth a, gift lists are worth a trillion. Um, and so you have two folks and they say, we're gonna build the best gift list thing ever. And they make, Oh, you can't see the green. Can you see the green? If you move up front, you can see the green better. Um, and so they start their life with an application that's very similar, very simple, and looks like every other application out there in the world. They write a little front-end web app. They have a little sort of back-end service thing. They're smart. They go to services right away. And then they have some stuff around it. Um, Apollo is just an MQE type thing. I had to pick one, and I didn't want to use one that anyone actually uses. So I picked Apollo. Um, it's not an Amazon deployment system. I realized that afterwards. Amazon has a deployment system called Apollo. So maybe it's an ode to them. And so in the beginning, you know, they have their two guys hacking on something. And it is, unfortunately, always two guys. And we're trying to change that. Um, and the stack is really easy. So in development, everything runs on their box. They have their two things. Life is good. Life is easy. You know, you push it out to production. For their initial one, it's probably the same two servers, but it gets a little bit more complicated, a little bit faster. But this is still incredibly simple. You know, they have four front-end web apps, two back, or four back-end ones, and then some infrastructural stuff. You can deploy this, you can develop this pretty much any way you want. If you want to SSH into every box and SCP code around, you can do that at this scale, and it's not a problem. Life is good, whatever. You know, but then they start adding some more features. You know, they decide, oh, we need an API. Maybe we want to be able to support some mobile stuff because it turns out, you know, you go into a store, you're like, oh, I want that. Click, upload something. You know, people want to be able to discuss things. You know, you can make it social by adding comments. It's really cool. And then you can be a social gift list application. Um, I say this having spent seven years in the social industry. All you need to do is add comments and you can call it social. <laughs> Alex is not smiling. <laughs> So, but the thing is that it's now getting a little bit more complicated and they're getting a little bit of traction so they hire some people and they now actually specialize and they have two teams. And I don't know why companies always go with a front end team and a back end team. I don't actually think that's the best way to organize things but companies always go with a front end team and a back end team. And so, unfortunately when you have all of this you now say, oh well, I'm on the back end team and I want to deploy the front end stuff so that I can test and I'm on the back end team and you start having all these communication burdens that two people sitting in somebody's living room didn't have. Um, so you have to start coming up with some agreements on what you're going to do. And so now we're actually going to talk about, oh, see I have something now that's more complicated. Uh, something different than Atlas first. because. When I was putting together a pure talk on Atlas, I realized that I can't honestly talk about Atlas without talking about Galaxy. And so they say, okay, we're going to deploy software. We're going to support software for each other. We have our API server, our front end server. How do we roll these things up? We need at least a minimal contract that'll let us work in arbitrary platforms. Because the back end team, you know, they're really cool. They want to use Go. And the front end team, <laughs> They're really cool, they want to use PHP. Um, so cool. What's that? So cool. Very hey, <laughs> PHP, it's, a, it's the hipster language. It's cool again, nobody, it, whatever. Um, so the features of, <laughs> what's that? Poser. Poser? <laughs> you know, it, isn't the whole hipster thing, you go back and do things that weren't cool, but they're cool yeah, now? Oh, yeah, okay, I get it, I'm sorry, yes. I, I'm, clearly I'm not. Um, so, but what they want to accomplish are, hey, look, we can deploy this really fast and we can roll it back really fast. 
because you know, they took a page from Facebook and say, well, move fast and break lots of things and roll back all the time. Um, you want to deploy a complete package. You don't want to say, oh, I want to get this deb and that deb and that deb and that deb and that deb and pull them all down. You just say, hey, here's what I'm deploying. Thank you. Uh, you want it to be uniform. You know, if I'm deploying PHP, if I'm deploying Java, if I'm deploying Go, if I'm deploying OPA, I want it to look the same. Uh, and you want it to be minimal touch. You don't want to have to have an SSH session open into every box because that sucks. Who has not done deployments where you have like 18 SSH terminals open? Who here has never done that? Come on, someone here hasn't done it. Yes! Is it because you've never deployed things? <laughs> Sweet, you're good. So we start with what is our deployment contract? And after much wrangling in front of a whiteboard and trips to local breweries, they decide that they could actually look at something very simple. We take a tarball and we put an RC script in it. Stop. That's, that's really the minimal contract that you need for a deployable unit. You have a tarball, you have an RC script in it, everything is inside your tarball. If you want to look at examples of this, I put a couple up, you can download them and look at them while I'm talking. Um, if you don't believe me that it's that simple. Those are tarballs for Apache with PHP, whatever, you can put anything with the tarball or with the RC script in. And so that's good, that gives us a bundle, that gives us something to target. You know, because you say, okay, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I like it, CD dot dot, tar, push it somewhere. You could do that, you know, really you should use some fancy build tool that requires a lot of plugins or something. But um, whatever. So you have that, it's like, okay, we have this tarball, how do we get it onto servers? Well, agents are popular. Um, I'm iffy on using agents for things, but they work well and they have a lot of benefits. So we'll run an agent, it'll you basically manage deployment routes. You say, I can put this tarball here, this tarball here, this tarball here. Um, start, stop, and do some basic reporting on what's there. And then we put an agent on a server, and we're not gonna try and do any weird bootstrapping thing. We're just gonna say use Chef or Puppet to install that and keep it running, or Upstart, or Daemon Tools, or whatever you use to start these. And then all the agents are going to report into some consoles so that we can get roll-ups of what we have out there. And we can say, oh, uh, how many of these do I have deployed and so on. This is the baseline low-level infrastructure for doing reasonable deployments from their point of view. And this is a model that we've been using at Ning for a couple of years, where a couple means since about 2006. Um, let me go into demo mode. So, um, I'll talk about the different ones at the end. Uh, I'm going to use a version of Galaxy called Sculptor, as in Sculptor Galaxy. Uh, let's see. So, I'll start a console. Can you all see this? And I'll start an agent. And this is just on my local machine. Okay, so they're started. The agent has a nice UI. Um, managers like this UI, it helps you sell it. I like this UI. Sculptor, agent list. Hey, nothing there. Let's deploy something. Uh, I mentioned, let's see, I did this so that I can copy it. We have a tarball. Copy link address. So that's a Galaxy tarball. Sculptor, agent, deploy. We'll call it, uh, what do we want to call this? Let's give the deployment a name. Somebody proposed something. ETE. ETE. Uh, we'll tell it to start as soon as it deploys it, save us a step, and we'll give it a link to the tarball. So are you including like uh, Apache and everything else in there that you need for this? Well, I believe I am. Dear God, I hope this worked. It worked. So that tarball, well, let's actually take a look at it then. What does it include? Uh, refresh the GUI, take a look at it. Uh, so it deployed to here. Okay, so what's in here? Uh, there's that RC script that we said 
we need. Uh, and that just takes stop, start, restart, whatever you want to do. It includes Apache. You know, all your normal Apache stuff. It includes PHP. It's all right in the tarball. It's about a 5 meg tarball. Um, and there, there's this, including everything in your tarball, let me segue into that for a second, because a lot of people like to argue with that. They're like, I want to use RPMs. I trust Red Hat to package Apache for me. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's like someone here has hopefully used Apache on Red Hat. Um, I don't know who did it first, and I don't know who said it first, but somebody made a statement once that everything that your application needs that can vary, you put with your application and you deploy at the time of your application. Uh, the reason being that you will screw up what is on the operating system you're deploying to at some point. And you will test against one environment, verify, whatever you do, no matter whether you do careful testing or uncareful testing, you're going to screw it up. And so if it's going to vary, you know, so my personal opinion is I'm probably not going to statically link libc unless the version of libc matters, in which case I will statically link libc and I'll put it in there. Um, this is, you know, so I, mean, I got the idea initially from a guy at Apple. I know Google statically links the entire world. Um, let's see, who else does the whole thing? I know. Is your database in there or is this just? What's that? Is your database in there? Well, no, because the database runs on another server, so it's a bundle that you put on that other server. Um, anyway, it's generally a good idea to put everything in there. There's a number of people who also say all your configuration also should be in that bundle. I'm iffy on that one, um, but there's a lot to be said for it. Anyway, so we have this thing running. I'm going to use the web UI because it's nice. You know, we can start it, or stop it. Oh, it stopped, yay. We can start it. Oh, it's running again, yay. Apache starts and stops fast. It's not Java. Um, so uh, let's see. We go back. We can say, oh, where are we? Uh, we can get the view. Now, here's the view from the agent. Uh, the agent reports into the console. There we go. Uh, what else can we possibly show you about Galaxy? Oh, we can stop things, start, whatever. We can clear it back out. That is <clears throat> Galaxy. Now, it's a very low-level tool. It basically lets you go out there and say, oh, start this, deploy this, stop that. Um, but frankly, that'll get you a long way. Yes, sir? So if you make some kind of changes to your code, then you don't want to deploy Apache. So is it, is it going to sort of honor files that are already in, on the file system and only update? OK, so the question was, if it's deploying Apache and whatnot, is it going to honor files on the file system no, and no, only I mean, update? No, I mean, like when you do an update, mm -hmm. like the Apache has already been deployed. So you would probably still put it in the tar. Ah, OK. Tarball, but then some of the files would be different. OK, so the question is, if you do an update, Apache has already been deployed. Is it going to just update what's there? And the answer is absolutely not. So let's do an update. And the reason I don't want to do an update is so an update, we stop it, we go back. Uh, the command line is much easier. What, I don't remember what the URL is. We deploy a new one. And then if it turns out that the new one has a bug, we stop it and we start the old one. Everything is completely independent and self-contained. Everything has its own deployment route that it's going into. It doesn't, you know, uh, I'm being recorded. It doesn't splat stuff all over the file system. Um, an update is not incremental in this deployment world. You know, an update is here's everything. It's all bundled together. Go. Um, y if you have gargantuan things, the idea of doing an incremental is nice. But then you, how do you do an incremental rollback? I don't want to work that one out. Um, I guess if you're like using Git or Subversion on your deployment servers to check it out, you could do that. Uh, buy me some, yeah, I don't like that model either. Um, but I got a lot of stuff I want to talk about, so I don't want to go into that unless somebody wants me to. OK, cool, I won't. So anyway, uh, let's see, that's going to fail deployment. Anyway, you could have arbitrary ones here. Let's start this again for fun. 
And life is good. We have Apache running. Actually, I'm going to stop it to save some memory because these things only have four gigs, which is not enough. So if we come back to the talk here, that gives us, just in case the demo wasn't working, I have a screencast of it. This one I do have the screencast. Oh, shiny, look. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mentioned that we've been using this in production for, at Ning for about five years. Uh, Sculptor is not the version we use at Ning. Um, Sculptor is a version that tries to make less assumptions about how your infrastructure works. There is a Ning version, which begat the Nest version, which begat the Proofpoint version. The Nest version begat the MetaMarkets version. Um, basically, as people left Ning, they because it's been open source forever, we just don't talk about it, because then people want like support and bug fixes and things. Um, they started doing it and they customized it because the Ning one has tons of assumptions about how your entire infrastructure configuration and everything works. Uh, Sculptor is an attempt to unwind that so you can say, well, my infrastructure works this way. Let's do it a little bit differently. Um, the green blocks are because ops doesn't like me showing people our server names. Okay, speaking of ops. Um, normally, ops deploys Apache. Ops deploys whatever version of you need. Frequently, ops deploys your applications. Um, this model presumes that ops provides you a baseline thing into which you can deploy. You know, so I love ops. I want to have ops people. They're great. They can carry the pager. They give me an operating system. Hopefully, they use something like Chef or Puppet to keep things up to date, put accounts, bring baseline stuff in. But I don't want to have to communicate what version of a library I need to deploy this version of my application and blah, blah, blah. Because it turns out that 90% of breakage comes when you try to communicate and fail. Like, oh, we need eglibc. No, I need ulibc. Well, those are the ones you said. Anyway, someone decides to put you know, Linux libc back on for some reason, um, and nobody knows. So ops is great. Let them manage servers. Let, app, let developers manage what they run on. If it varies by deployment, let them do it. So, but this talk, okay, so I'm now transitioning off of Galaxy and back to the whole point of this talk, which is we have lots of people trying to work together and deploy software that works despite having lots of different teams. Can I go there? Awesome. So back to the problems here. So now they have a way to deploy the software and then get it out there. But here we start running into the problem of having different teams because you have, oh, we've got, you know, 16 developers now. Two teams, oh no, that's unrealistic. We've got eight developers now. Two teams of four, and so we're gonna parallelize things. We're gonna have four things going at once. We wanna put a new API, we want, you can read. They wanna have four projects going at once. And the problem with four projects going at once is now you basically have, for the API work, the API server is getting changed, and it relies on the GIFT server, so that's getting changed. And another team, is changing to the front end and putting that discuss feature in. And another team is changing way much because they said, oh, the way that we sharded GIFTs, bad. We screwed up. We need to completely redesign how we do sharding before we get really big. Never, ever do that. <laughs> but do it before you get really big. Um, and basically, the problem is that as you're working on something, you want everything you're not working on to be stable. And you want to be able to change what you're doing and push broken versions and say, I know this doesn't work, but I just want to iterate on it quickly and let somebody look at it and show it to a product manager who can say, oh, that's the wrong color, because that's what product managers do. Um, and so the way that most people start addressing this is to say, well, I have too many things to run it on one box now. We'll just create development environments. So we'll have four different development environments. And this team will work here, 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 and God help you when you need to push code into a different environment or you inherit a new environment because all of a sudden you're like, well, it's left in this unknown state. Let me rebootstrap every box and bring it back up. And that really, really sucks. And so what we want to be able to do is say, here's a system, please put it there. Here's an environment, put my system in that environment. And that's what Atlas does. So we start by saying, what actually does a system consist of? Well, we have, where did my pointer go? I think this has a laser on it. 
Sweet. So the front end team runs a system that has a front end load balancer, an API load balancer, the front end server, an API server, and some memcaches. And so, okay, we have that, but we need a little bit more information. You know, for instance, the load balancers, no, oh, our load balancers, and these are app servers, and that's something that we don't write, and so it's its own thing, it's memcache. And we care about how many of them there are. Ooh, I skipped one. You're not supposed to see this part yet. You know, so we only want <laughs> one load balancer, you know, but we want four of the front end things, four of the API things, and two memcaches. And then we actually want to be able to say what's on them. You know, so we want to use Galaxy to install front end version 002, and we want to put each of these in the front load balancer, you know, vice versa. Uh, this is a special one. Um, I left it in to be honest, um, which is we want to, we're a memcache. Lots of people use memcache, so let's register ourselves in a particular pool of memcache servers. Um, when we see the back end team, they're using, this is using Zookeeper. You can use whatever you want. Um, so what we say is, okay, right here we have a nice, succinct view of this is what the front end team has. And if we want to change the version of the server, well, we change that. If we want to add double them, we change that. And you could splat that out. Now, we have the back end team. They have their own descriptor of what they have. You know, so in that case, they own the message queue, they own Zookeeper. Uh, they have a nested system. If we look at, oh, come on, here we go. If you remember, we basically were sharding here. So each of these is logically its own system. And so we have a nested system of which we have two. Each of those has two gifts things and a MySQL. And again, we basically now have the logical description of what the service looks like. From the sort of engineering or understanding what it is perspective, that gives you enough information. But it doesn't give you enough information to actually deploy or bring up one of these things. So in development, let's say that you know, you're not on a four gig laptop, you're on a nice 16 gig desk desktop. You might want to use VMware to spin it up. And so you define an environment. So dev is the one everything defaults to. Thank you, Rails. Um, we want to override the cardinalities. So we only want one of each of these things in development. We don't want to waste memory on extra ones. Uh, this is unfortunate glue that you need to be able to SSH into things. So generate a key pair. And this is where it gets interesting now. There are, I think the next slide does this, yeah. So a provisioner is one of the components in Galaxy that says, oh, this is, give me a server. Provision a server for me. This one uses VMware with, uh, it's right now set up to use VM run, which is the command line interface to VMware. Um, and then give me URL, so Ubuntu, here's a URL for the tarred up Ubuntu virtual machine. Um, and then you have bases, which are the things which line up between system descriptors and environment descriptors. The API server, base is an app server. Oh, in VMware, an app server inherits from Ubuntu, which uses VMware, installs Emacs, uh, and then puts the sculptor agent on and life is good. Uh, in a different world, uh, so here's actually a snippet from uh, Ning's configuration. Uh, we use Chef to assign things into roles rather than explicitly saying apt, go install Emacs with apt. Um, Chef is nice, you can just do it, put it in this role. Uh, we use RDS, so some configuration information for an Oracle in RDS and EC2. Um, but it works, and you know, we interpolate in what the image name is, because if you're using Ubuntu, they take their images down for some reason. They don't just leave them there. They're like, oh, well, here's an updated version. We'll get rid of the old ones. Um, we're lazy. We just use their base image. It forces us to actually get the chef recipes right, rather than having the magic AMI. So if you want to now bring up a system, you clone the definition of it, you go into the directory, and you converge it. Let's look at that. So here is a smaller version of it, the system. Can you see this? I can make this one bigger. This is why I said move up front. Move up front, you're all the way in back. 
No, move up front. You're all the way back. OK. So here's a smaller subset because I'm cheap and I don't feel like paying EC2 costs while I demo this, um, and my laptop can't handle a lot. You know, the front end system with a load balancer, uh, the app server, two of them named Tiger and Fluffy. You know, if you care about your names, you, can you give it an array? Um, we're going to install Galaxy and add it to the front load balancer. The, here's the VMware thing. I'm not going to do that because I was preparing this and the wireless here is horrible. So I'm just going to go straight to EC2. Now this one is a little bit fancier looking. Let's, see, let's look at it real quick. So uh, this just displays nice progress bars. You can turn it off if you want to see the log instead. Uh, this will ask you for your S uh, API key and so on, and then just record it in configuration. And here, the environment, you can define servers that don't make sense from the application perspective. So we need the sculptor console. We're going to the load balancer in EC2 is an ELB instance. We need our security group. And the rest of it we've seen. Um, I'm not going to go into virtual installers right now because, frankly, it takes a while to spin it up. So I'm going to start it going. Let's see. OK. Atli oh, and you'll notice a quick convention. Everything sits in a model directory. Dash E, EC2 front, tell it the environment. It defaults to dev. We're going to do EC2. Let's bring up the EC2 instance. Come on, please network, work. Oh, there we go. And now, yeah, security group creates fast. And it's just going to go and wend its way across bringing up servers. Um, come on, EC2, go fast. You can do it. So this is going to bring it up. It's going to configure the load balancer. It's going to spin up the servers. It's going to put them into the right role. Unfortunately, I used absolute positioning for the progress bars, for which I apologize. <laughs> Whoa, I confused it. Unconfused, you can do it. There we go, it's making progress. It actually provisioned the EC2 instances. What's the console zero bit about? What's that? What's the console zero line? Okay, the console zero line, the, the way that it names things, if you look at, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the name, everything has there we go. A fairly strong identity. And if we go back to the configuration for this, doo -doo 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 -doo, we will see, well, the console case, that was defined here. And so we have, boop. oh, come on. OK, so it's utility zero, console zero. And so we had a utility system. And we had within that console. And so identity tokens basically consist of a type and a unique token. And in the case of this, we just said we wanted, we didn't tell it how many consoles we wanted, so it assumed one. And if you don't ask, give it a specific name, it just starts counting from zero. And so it's utility zero. We only have one utility system. Console zero It's the first one in there. Uh, the alternative is we have you know, Fluffy and Tiger, we wanted to name the front end servers. And so we have front end zero, uh, front Fluffy. Now, stash E, let's see, we were on uh, EC2 front. This is everything that just spun up. So Atlas is implemented in Java and it uses JRuby, so the startup time is the worst of every world. <laughs> and our load balancer is. Actually, I don't know why I'm copying this because there we go. Yay, there, we're running an EC2. Now, that's well and good, but we want to be able to update this thing. So let's, uh, you know, update number two, you know, converge that. We'll get update number two. It's going to say, oh, what's actually changed? Let me stop, start get things going. Uh, and in that way, Atlas can spin up various servers. This should go faster this time, I promise, because it already has the servers. Where are the packages coming from? Where are the packages coming from? Yeah. OK. 
So if we go back and look at the, okay, so it starts with the installer. And so it says, hey, use Galaxy to put front end 02. We come back to the EC2 definition and we look for the Galaxy installer. We say, oh, that's a script under sculptor install.sh. Um, that's because I didn't want to write a custom component because I'm trying to avoid writing custom components. And that's just a shell script that will be executed on the server, uh, which in this case, the semantics we want are there's only one thing of a given type on a server. So it says, oh, is there something there? Wipe it out, put the new one on. Um, there are various ways you can do this. The reason I did it this way is because I didn't want to do port juggling for this demo. Um, in an ideal world, you assign a random port in production and you announce what you're on or you listen on a queue or something like that. And so anyway, so that is where it's getting that package. So here, we'll see it's actually downloading it from this URL. I used the public one because it's a public demo. So if you wanted to go look at static.gift, oh, I forgot the, oh, the whole joke in the beginning. It's the universal gift lift, gift list, so it's the gift UDDI. <laughs> Thank you, I needed a laugh. Um, so that's where, uh, see, other ones, the apt stuff, it's just pulling from the public repo. You know, so you can, let's see, where do we go? So install OpenJDK, uh, Sculptor, it's installing from a deb, but I don't have it in a apt repo anywhere, so it curls it down and does a dpackage dash i. Oh, you can't see the mouse, can you? So it's pulling it from wherever you want to put it. Um, in a real system, I would probably wish there was something better than Chef or Puppet to bring it up to spec, but I'd probably use Chef or Puppet to bring it up to spec instead. And actually, in this kind of world, I'd probably use Chef Solo rather than the Chef server because it frees up half the memory on the box. Um, I got lots of in-jokes for people who use certain tools, and I can tell who uses the tools because they laugh at them. Uh, let's see, is this done yet? Oh, it is. So we should now see, oh, come on. It failed the update. No, it didn't, it's still loading. It failed the update. Did I not save? I hate live demos, they fail sometimes. Okay, for some reason it failed the update and I don't know why it did. I'm not gonna run it again. That should say front end 002 now unless I screwed something up, which I did. Sorry for live demo. Um, and so with that, we deployed that singular one, which is nice. Where did my slides go? There they are. But we haven't really solved the problem yet that we have all these teams working together. We have a description of a system, but we don't have, you know, the here's this, here's this system, here's this system, here's this system, and there, here's this system. So let's allow us to define a system as an external thing at a URL. And then we can have all of our different parts at different URLs. And if we wanted to, so we have one system that pulls together various ones. And if we wanted to, we could say, oh, I'm the front end team. I'm working on the reshard branch. I'm gonna use this URL for this part of the system while I'm working in that environment. Whereas production is going to use that one. And what that gives you, and I actually have a demo of this one, is, oh, what did I do? I changed it. Uh, I can't type. Close these out, no, don't save, don't save. Here we have the front end and the extern the front and the back. And again, I was gonna do this locally on VMware, but I don't trust VMware today on this network. So I put them back up on that static site. And we can just update that one. You know, we have the same EC2 configuration. I gave it a different name. Uh, Atlas dash E EC2. And we'll see that it's going to spin up the extra servers from both of them this time, assuming it can reach those things out on the public internet right now, which it can. 
So it loaded all the models and it's going to bring everything up, the front end and the back end system. Um, and so in this way, you can say, oh, well, we can actually have the system as a composition of independently managed things. So you pick when you want to merge changes from the other team for your services. You know, if you want to have these two branches going, you can treat your system as a Git repo. And that subsystem as a different Git repo. And you can basically pull them together as you want to. Come on. There we go. It's going, it's going. I really should have recorded this ahead of time so I could fast forward through spinning up EC2 instances. That part's really boring. Because what I wanted to do is I now have this whole spiel where I'm like, oh, let's update it. Well, let's add some. Let's remove them. And it just actually correctly converges the environment on all those changes that you're making. Yes, sir? So if I want to um, configure like an F5 load balancer or something like that, yep. what I need is just write like a custom command kind of thing, which would then write a script. OK. So if you want to, okay, so the question is, if you want to convert something like an F5 load balancer, you know, something that is not a nice public API, although F5s have a nice API. So the way that I would honestly do it if I had to do it today is I would write a custom component in Atlas that in the Java API that would basically, it's one function, oh, sorry, two, two functions. Um, basically one to make it so and the other to unwind it. And the way that that works is like, oh, if we look at the configuration, they're all URL-like. So here's our front-end definition. You know, we'll see that this is kind of URI-like. And, and the system's designed so that you pass it in and you receive, here's the host, here's a, basically a persistent space where you can store key value-ish type things, namespace key values, so that it can be backed by either SQLite, Postgres, file system, you know, whatever. That's one of those things that's configurable. Um, and you'll say, okay, here's a URI, here's the host I want this on, go put it on there. And I've been trying to use less custom components and more things like shell scripts in the local thing because, I don't know, it feels like the way it should go. And there's no good way to plug in non-Java API things today, time to write it. Um, I, I, there's, it would be very easy to say, here, invoke this external plugin as a separate process, and I'll pass it information. Um, that doesn't exist yet. So to configure an F5, you probably want to write a custom plugin, or you could use the script thing like I did for talking to Sculptor um, if you just want to have it as an external script and it doesn't need a lot of extra information. You had a question? Go. But, um, I mean, this whole stack is kind of new to me. I usually like use Chef front to back for the deployments. Yep. Well, and, and I like where you're going, but with everything bundled and vent, like vendored up and in that one bundle, mm -hmm. what do you do about differing architectures? Like, we've, like, for example, I'm deming on a Mac, but I yeah. like to an Ubuntu system. Or, yep. Right? Like, so I don't see how the package affords to that. So the question is, how do you actually do things on different architectures? So that that's not so. Back to the Galaxy side of things. If you're producing a single binary bundle, how do you do that for different environments? Well, you produce a bundle for every environment you want to deploy onto. So for the gift UDDI, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, there will be, oh, come on, organize it better than that. Yeah, so here I just append, hey, here's Darwin 11, here's x86, 64 Linux. Now, these are the various Apache things that I built up for here. And if we actually look at the configuration, you can see the artifact. Oh, good, it kind of finished. Uh, here we go. The EC2 definition here. Uh, it's in the other one. You can see where the front end system, the console is actually spinning up a build environment for me and checking out the front end web server so that I can you know, build it and push up to S3 there very easily. So if you need Apache on a particular version, you build it against that version. Um, and honestly, like I can say from seven years of doing it, that's a good way to do it. It works fine. Um, if you don't care that much, you know, you don't actually have to do that during development. So if we go 
Here is the project for the front end system. And I want to bundle up a new one. I just bundled it up. You know, here we go. I'm building a new, you know, it builds really fast because I already have Apache, PHP, and all that built. Otherwise, we'd be waiting until the next conference for PHP to finish building. Um, but there we go. We have 001 snapshot right there. Um, that works fine for the most part. Uh, one of the versions, you know, so a gentleman I know, Henning, who also uses Galaxy, does, you know, considers Apache to be one of those things that what version you're running doesn't matter. And so he just RPM installs it. Um, actually, he probably doesn't even RPM install it anymore. He, you know, they just finally put Chef in. He probably has a Chef recipe to put it on. There's many ways to do it. Um, I like anything that you care about the version, you want to put in that bundle. If you don't care about the version, yeah, fine, you know, let the base operating system worry about that. We should now have the entire world. Oh, come on, where's my terminal? There it is. Do, do, do. Oh, I CD'd out. Model. And netlist dash e ec2 list. Uh, actually, it's just SSH into the console. Oh, so the convenient stuff like being able to SSH into stuff based on the name that you gave it. Now, and we see all the Galaxy instances um, fired up. Uh, the Sculptor one doesn't have as nice a UI. It's pretty much designed to be tooled rather than to be itself right now. That'll, ch that'll evolve. That's the meat of it. Argue with me. No. Go. <laughs> I'll keep asking another one. I think you're, you're speaking my language here. I'm really enjoying it. But, uh, uh, you know, you have your front end team, you have your back end team, your yep. front end team. The thing that I haven't seen yet that maybe you do okay. is uh, when the front end developer is developing, they probably just want to run the back end on their machine, but the front end against their checked out copy. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So the, the question from Matt was. Typically, you may want to say the backend team, you want to check it out, you want to spin it up on VMware or your OpenStack stuff somewhere, and you just want to run your local version of the front end. That goes into something I specifically avoided talking about in this talk, which is configuration, service discovery, and how your system wires itself up at runtime. Um, but I'll go there. In general, uh, I believe that most of the time, you're going to be better off having your systems discover themselves dynamically at runtime. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms for this. And there's the like formal IETF things like DNS-based discovery that Apple came up with that I honestly think is an abomination. Um, and then there's very simple things like having a shared NFS mount where you write a file that includes your information, which is fragile, but you know what? It works better than the DNS-based one. Uh, the way that people seem to be going is using a Zookeeper to find things within a data center. Um, Zookeeper is basically a chubby clone with slightly different characteristics. Um, one of the most conservative, critical, experienced guys that you know came up in his career writing search engines in the 90s and doesn't believe anything works would probably have Zookeeper's baby if he could because he loves that thing so much. So I trust Zookeeper because Ray likes Zookeeper. Um, it's awesome. Really, really awesome. <laughs> Daniel likes Zookeeper too. Um, we don't use Zookeeper because it didn't exist when we put in our service discovery thing. We just have a HTTP server that you're like, hey, I'm here, post. And you do that to five of them and then you, know, you periodically go ask the five, hey, what do you have? And you need the results. So, the, so to come back around to your question, how do you do a local thing? Well, you spin it up, you look at the discovery server that came up, and you say, and you point your local instance at that discovery server, and you're now part of it. So you don't use any of this against your locally checked out copy? No, that, that's what I'm saying you do, is you check it out, yeah. you run your locally checked out one, yeah. and you configure your locally checked out one to talk to the discovery server in 
your environment that you spun up for development. Yeah, yeah. but that, that configuration is not something that these tools help you with. You would use whatever other discovery mechanism you have. Yes, these tools do, well, these tools can do discovery for you okay. um, in that some, some people don't like using discovery. They really like to have a configuration file on every server that has every other server's connection information. <laughs> what is very popular. So and it works fine as long as you have, you know, like 10 servers. Once you have 100, it gets really agonizing. You know, and once you have several thousand, it's just not, not going to work. And so, let me see here. Here we go. Uh, uh, one of the examples I have of, Word, of this is a WordPress setup. And I don't have the full checkout here. But you'll see, well, here, we'll look at this one. So the Sculptor implementation. Um, I didn't want to put a discovery service up for this. And so it uses a configuration file to find the console. And one of the things that Atlas can do is say, here's a local ERB file. Um, Atlas has two things with data. It has a scratch space per run, which things can write into. So you say scratch console equals at, here's the identity. And so here you see we find the space, which is the persistent one, and the scratch, which is not. We look up the console, line five, we put it in console. And down here, the CLI configuration, we tell it where the console is. And so this will actually splat that configuration file onto every server that it's told to. And it works OK. You could do that. And this works because really there's only one console in this, in this particular setup, so I don't mind so much. Uh, in the proof point implementation of Galaxy, it uses Simple DB, because there's just pretty hard coded to work in EC2. In the Nest version, it checks out a Git repo and does some magic. The MetaMarkets one is forked from the Nest one. So various things have ways of doing this. Um, the right answer, though, is to use a discovery mechanism at runtime. So what sort of scale can you talk a little bit about? Yep. About sort of what's small and what's big? What, yeah, so for you, what's the scale? OK. So of the two things I've talked about here, uh, Galaxy we use to manage environments of up to about 5,000 servers. Um, that's the biggest, and that's actually highly virtualized. But from Galaxy's point of view, there's 5,000 of them. Um, in practice, there's a few hundred. And the way that Ning works is we basically use an LXC container per thing that we deploy. And so, oh, here's this world. It's all yours. Have fun. Use any port you want. Um, Atlas, right now, I probably would not use over a couple hundred servers um, because it's basically dedicating a thread for each thing it's spinning up. You can get a lot of threads going, but you're not going to want to go over a couple hundred things with it right now. There's a change in the works to be clever about how it updates things. So the other thing Atlas does right now is it basically builds up the, oh, here's the list of everything I need to do for this instance to update it from the previous one. Let me move through in explicit stages. So it provisions, it initializes, it installs, and everything provisions, then everything initializes, then everything installs. And the only synchronization mechanism within a stage is to use stuff in the scratch space. It's wor it, I mean, it works well enough for what we need it for at Ning. It's not a good general purpose one yet. Um, the change that's in flight, um, well, so instead of a provisioner operating on one thing at a time, it operates on a set of things. And the big thing is scheduling that is actually an interesting problem. Um, and I got to remember how to do dynamic programming to do it in order to try and solve it reasonably. Hey, I don't have a CS background. <laughs> this is all fun for me. Um, I never took a test on it. And so um, that change will start saying, oh, we're applying you know, the front end update to 700 things. Here, Galaxy tool, apply it to these 700 things. And that's needed so that you can do the nice you know, incremental rollout. Here's one. OK, that seemed to work for an hour. Here's the next 20%. You know, Here's the next 50%. You know, and do that. You know, the, that Atlas doesn't do that today because we haven't needed it to. Um, Atlas began its life in Ning where we have, wow, we got lots of teams and we have a dozen or so environments in which we develop and test and it was unbearable. Um, 
And so the life cycle of the tool was, let's get it so it works on Ning stuff. Uh, after we get it working on Ning stuff, I've got the all clear to spend you know, about half of my time generalizing it so it could work for anybody, which was really exciting. But as, after, soon after we got it working for Ning stuff, we got bought and the priorities got reshuffled and I no longer got to spend half my time. So the generalization process is happening slower. Um, Galaxy is safe to use today, it's rock solid. Um, Atlas, unless you're comfortable tracing through Java when you hit weirdness, you probably don't want to use it today. The other question is, you sort of started off with talking about this from, from a perspective of, of teams. How yep. Did, how does this rollout change those team dynamics? Okay. So the, the question, actually we're, we're small. Did everyone hear David? Yeah. Okay, good. Did anyone not hear David? The people on the Oh, the people recording, crud. <laughs> so the question is, how does this tool change team dynamics? Um, the design intent of this tool on team dynamics was to require less fine-grained coordination. Um, because what we were running into was you'd have, you know, the Basel team making changes here, another team working changes here, which are in totally separate parts of the code base and don't affect each other, but you need both of them to work for somebody else. And the fine-grained, okay, I'm going to check this in and you should update that, was not palatable. Um, so the intent for how it works is that you will say, okay, I'm going to work in this branch on this thing and this branch on this thing. Um, and that has been adopted a little bit, but it's asking people to change how they work, so it's not, we haven't seen the full benefit that we want, that we believe we should see from it. Um, because changing how people works is hard, or changing how people work is hard. But the idea is that you can say, okay, instead of four teams coordinating closely, you'll have two teams coordinating closely on named branches, and they'll pull those versions of their system definitions. And then they only need to coordinate, and when, they, when it works, and they're actually, you know, it, it's going back to that whole, oh, you don't ever want a big bang integration, but sometimes you do want a big bang integration once a day, every other day, you know, so that you don't break stuff when you have too many people talking about it. Yes, Aaron. Can you do the equivalent of like depending on the snapshot where like every time you push you'll get the very latest version of X and Y, but not all these other things where you just you don't you mm -hmm. hold those stationary? Okay, so the question is, can you do the equivalent of depending on a snapshot where every time you push, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to get this new version of the thing immediately. Um, the re and the answer is if you want it, yes. The reason that this is all text based and all file based and imports things via URLs is so that you can actually wire all of that up via commit hooks. And so we don't do this, but we intend to do this once we trust the tool well enough, is you say, okay, this environment is managed by this repo. You check in and you put, here's the file for that environment. Um, you push to it, you get the changes. Now, if it's external stuff, you can have a cron job that every 15 minutes says, oh, has this changed? Oh, it's changed. Let me converge the environment. And it's gonna say, oh, I'm pulling from this branch, which is active, this branch, which is active, this branch, which is active. You look like you're not understanding what I'm saying, so I'm not saying it well. well I guess what I'm thinking, I'm not sure if you're talking about exactly the same thing. I may not be. I'm talking about, which is like, you know, if there's a team over there yep. that's, that's building something that, that I need. And you want their changes right away. Well, no. No. I want their changes, like, Every time they tell me, okay, we have a stable, ah. I, want to, I want to say, okay, now I'm going to deploy and get the okay. next version of that. I don't, I don't want to make them specifically package that into like a name. Right. It goes to the QA and all that. Yep, yep. I just want to say, you know, at the time you told me there's a good build out there, I want to recycle my environment and have to slurp that. Yep. And then I won't, I won't do it again until he tells me, you know, again, if there's a good version or something like that. So it's okay. not quite like I want the latest every 15 minutes. It's more. Okay, so I, I think I understand what you're saying now. So instead, you basically what they, you want to be able to say, okay, it's ready for you. Go use the latest snapshot. Okay, so the way that I would personally do that is I would say, great, if you have a particular version you want me to use, either have that on a branch or have that on a tag. Okay, and then I depend, and these are Git 
uh, one of the Git UI things, you know, that is the reshard branch, and I'll say, oh, you pushed there, great, let me go converge my environment. It'll pull that down at the time that I do that. You could depend on a tag instead. Um, th this is all designed exactly to be able to treat it like source code. So yes, you can do that. There's no canonical way to do it yet. It's a brand new tool. We'll get a canonical way. That's yes? What? That says Brian. Well, we will. I mean, I'm going to use this, so I'm going to make a canonical way. I, if nobody else does, if somebody else does, then I don't have to. Yes? So before you would recommend that someone actually uses this in production, what do you, what do you think it's missing? OK, so the question was, before I'd recommend somebody use this in production, what is it missing? Um, it's not very helpful when something goes wrong. So it's got lots of logging. Uh, it has too much logging at the moment. And so you can find what went wrong, but you have to troll through the log from the entire run to see what went wrong. Um, so a better way of telling you, oh, this failed, here's a nice message explaining why. So when right now you're doing something strange and it's like, oh, it's spun up, wait a minute, it's not working right, you're trolling through the log to see why. And I don't consider that to be acceptable. So, I mean, I consider it acceptable for me. I don't consider it, you know, like if you were using it and it's like, hey, it didn't work, help. It's, it doesn't hold your hand. Um, Could this be Atlas or Galaxy? Atlas. So if you want to use Galaxy in production today, if you grab Ning's Galaxy, Proofpoint's Galaxy, or Ness's Galaxy, they're all rock solid. Have fun. Uh, if the one I've been using today, Sculptor, has the similar, uh, well, no, it's, it's, more, it's better than, uh, actually, it's better than Ning's Galaxy in a lot of ways because it's written to be friendly to anyone else. Um, I would use it today, but it, I, would not cons I would not use it if you're not comfortable reading code. You know, so like a developer who's doing sysadmin could use it and if something went really weird because it hasn't been used heavily in production anywhere. You know, so my, my premise for production is I wrote it or someone I know is brilliant wrote it and says it's good or it's in use really widely. Like I'm hyper conservative um, unless I wrote it, because I can debug it if I wrote it. Um, so unless you're me, I wouldn't use Sculptor in production yet, because I haven't used it in production yet. But we'll be using it for like Glam's ad server soon, so it should be, I should trust it then. Um, but I wrote it. Uh, so what, what else does Atlas need before I use it in production? Uh, for a big system, I would want the change to have the components being able to do hundreds of things at once instead of one at a time because I don't ever want to do a uncarefully controlled rollout. You know, one of the reasons I would not use Chef Server to roll out something like an application is because, oh, it'll update sometime in the next 15 minutes. Like, no. You know, I want this one and I want to monitor that one carefully and then very carefully get the rest out. Um, some people don't care about that. I do because I do public facing web stuff. So I care a lot about that. Uh, what else does it want for production? I should probably get it into a public apt repo. It's not there yet. But whatever, you can curl down a deb and install it. Um, yeah. yeah. Are the system deployment descriptors compatible between Atlas and Galaxy? Okay, so the question was, are the uh, deployment descriptors compatible between Atlas and Galaxy? Um, the answer to that is it, the question doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, <laughs> sorry, no, no, I mean, it's, I, I've run through both of them close together. So think of Galaxy, so Galaxy is more like Ansible or Funk or Fabric or Capistrano. You know, Galaxy, you say, put this there and it puts that there. And you say, start this, and it starts it. Atlas is, take this whole bunch of machines and instantiate this system doing whatever you need to do to get them right, and make it look like that. Um, and is the, originally, it was just a talk on Atlas, but I realized that I'm not, it gets really gnarly if you don't have a good low-level deployment tool to talk about building a system, and so I had to put a, a Galaxy in as well or the descriptors all got like these huge, horrible, long steps of shell scripts that I didn't want to go into. So they're not compatible because they're totally different tools that don't rely on each other. Um, 
Does that sufficiently not answer your question? <laughs> So what were you saying you can use one now and then? Okay. So, the, uh, so the, then what, why was I saying you use one now but not the other? So let me go through my last slide that sums that up nicely. So Atlas lives at that URL. It's Apache. Actually, everything on this page is Apache 2 licensed. Um, Atlas is a Ning internal project that the main person working on it right now is me, and I get about one day a week on the clock and then nights and weekends, which is why I say don't use it in production unless you're me. Or you're willing to work on it, which is what I'm hoping to get out of the talk. Um, if you're willing to work on it, it's going to get really good really fast because I get really embarrassed when my code doesn't work. I have what I call my 20-minute bug fix turnaround. I, I will turn around a bug fix in 20 minutes if I possibly can. I'll drop everything. Like, I'll say, sorry, Cora, I can't put you to bed yet. I have to fix the bug because I'm embarrassed when my stuff doesn't work. Galaxy has at least four different forks in use in production in lots of different places. That shit works. It's been working for years. The, co the concepts are good. Uh, the best implementation right now is this one. Uh, basically, that's Dane Sundstrom's fork that he wrote at Proofpoint. Um, I don't know if it's going to become the best because he started at Facebook day before yesterday. So they're not using it in production, but Proofpoint is, and we'll see what happens with that. But it's probably the best one, but it has no documentation. Uh, this one has the best documentation, but it hasn't been used on as big a system. Uh, that's Henning Schmiedehausen's fork. Um, he's German, and he writes documentation like a German. Sorry to make. Uh, countrywide slurs, but Germans write a lot of documentation. So you can figure out how to use that one. Um, that's my re-implementation to make less assumptions about the infrastructure. That's Pierre. He works at, Gal or at Ning. He used to work at VMware. He has re-implemented it about five times. He has the best understanding of how it should work. Um, and he manages Ning's version for the most part. Uh, he has his own branch for where he goes in and does strange experiments, like, I'm going to do it in Erlang today. You know, he, he's 20-something and no kids, so he can do that. Um, and then Ning's canonical one that is the most, the one that's been used the most and on the biggest systems, uh, which proof points catching up, but Ning's is still slightly bigger, um, is at the top URL. And then all the code from today is in this, and I'm just going to sort of keep that as an example of how to use it, and I'll keep it updated. But yeah, you know, Galaxy, the concept works, the implementations are good, you can pick between them. Um, Atlas isn't quite there yet. I'm tempted to quit my job and work on it, but I don't have that much in savings yet. <laughs> I, um, maybe if Glam does IPO this year, I will, I don't know. But it's an interesting enough problem. Uh, the other thing that you should consider if you're looking at this, all of this is designed if you want to have very tight control over your running environment. If you actually are willing to accept lots of constraints and not so much control, uh, who was here for the last talk in this room? Yeah, go look at like Cloud Foundry or Heroku or something because frankly, they're gonna take a lot of crap out of your hands if you don't care about the details. If you care about the details, this is the care about the details version of Cloud Foundry. Um, Cloud Foundry's a lot higher level, but you have to worry about less. And VMware has like 8,000 people working on it. So bugs get fixed faster. Are you 8,000 times as good? What's that? Are you 8,000 times as good? <laughs> OK, well, it's not a, well, it's a different problem. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Cool. Hopefully, I can give this talk again in a year with actually much more use cases on how to teams use it rather than how they might. We'll see. Thank you, everybody.